everybody. Uh, my name is Jared. Where's the, oh, yeah, I'm Cole Alexander. We're the Black Lips. We're very, very honored to be here today. It's, uh, it's really a special thing. Um, we started in 1999 in Atlanta, Georgia. We were, uh, we were in high school, and uh, we weren't very good at education, so we tried to play music, and we weren't very good at that either. But we never gave up because it was always really fun to play music. Um, yeah, this is the closest we've ever gotten to a college, so it's really cool for us to be here. Uh, neither of us finished <laughs> or got past the 10th grade. But all the teachers that told us that we were going to be working at gas stations, we're more successful than them now. So uh, I don't want to say we got where we are out of spite, but they kind of helped us uh, get to where we, are, we were because we had to prove everyone wrong. It was kind of our only thing. Yeah, but it's exciting to see people actually get to study uh, music. I always feel like we can learn stuff and take notes from people. I feel like you guys can probably teach your, teach your stuff because the industry is constantly changing. So. Yeah, we always were like um, kind of professional amateurs. We uh, come up with everything just like homespun. We make our own like crappy lights. Um, and that's kind of our charm is to do everything sloppy and like crappy because we're not like super talented musicians. But there aren't any rules. You can just really do what you want. Yeah, I mean, if, if people like it, and we're, I consider us more entertainers than uh, musicians because like my uh, colleague here, Cole, said, we're not very good musicians, but uh, somehow we did something right. But I think it was just through sheer uh, dumb determination and lack of options. Uh, so we kind of took <laughs> and we kind of took what we had, or what we could do good, and we used that to our advantage. And uh, really, when we should have given up a long time ago, uh, we never did. And it kind of goes. We kind of have like a life philosophy of uh, whatever you do. Even if you suck at it, like, do awesome at it. Like, if you're a garbage man, like, chuck that trash with all your heart. Uh, I mean, just, we've had, I mean, it's, I can't, I think we've been a band for, like, 13 years, 13 years, years or something. We've been playing together since we were, like, 13 or 14. But, uh, I mean, there's a million times we should have quit. Like, the first tour we ever booked, we booked... Actually, one of our roommates booked it and I helped him. And then the day we were supposed to leave, he got taken to prison and we didn't see him for a few years. But our first, our first show uh, was here at the Dixie Tavern, and, uh, which is gone now. But we showed up and there was no one there and they had no idea there was a show. I don't even think they were open that, light, that night. They let us play and we were like, I would be bummed about if that happened now. But back then, it's like I think I was probably 17. Uh, it was amazing, and we there was a homeless man outside, and we invited him in, and uh, we basically just practiced for him and got drunk. Yeah, we. But he, it was just one guy, and the the bum was totally rocking out. And, and I just imagine we were like in the Superdome, and we just like rocked like there was a hundred thousand people. And I think the most important thing for us was to to have passion. It wasn't so much about I want to become rich and famous or get chicks. We were really passionate about music and have fun doing it. And so we were never really gonna quit if we failed because we just liked doing it. And so you know, after about six or seven years of performing, the ball started to roll and we started to get more success with the, with the media and press and record sales. But it took about yeah, six or seven years till we could actually make a living doing that. So yeah, I think passion, it should always be the motivation, you know? Yeah, for us it was never, we, I mean we had a lot of bad early setbacks, like a few days before our first tour, our, our original guitarist was killed in a car wreck, uh, we were all homeless for a long time, uh, and that was by choice, we're not saying we were, it was like poor us, I mean we were middle class kids from the suburbs, so I mean that was definitely our choice, but uh, I haven't gone through all that, it was, it was always kind of, we set our goals really small. Like little, like little steps, and they kept, nothing ever super terrible happened. It was all, all, always something a little better would get, like we'd get paid or someone would buy us dinner, and that was like a victory. Uh, one of our earliest goals was to go to Europe and play, and we lost so much money. A lot of it wasn't even our money that we lost, but now it's, it's good. But once we did those goals, we just worked our way up a little bit. We didn't set our goals very high. We didn't really think much of ourselves. 
Um, but even like that first show we played here at Dixie Tavern, that was, like I said, I probably wouldn't have fun doing that now, but at the time it was, it was better than any huge festival that we've played uh, to this day. Yeah, and also for our band, because we slowly did a slow gradual rise in popularity, I felt like we never became like a hype band. I see a lot of bands that become really hot one summer and then next year I don't hear anything about them. And I always wondered what, what causes that, if you just come up too fast, if you fall just as hard or what. But yeah, it felt like a healthy gradual you know, rise to where we are now. And we're by no means like famous or anything, but we're able to make a living making music and doing what we love. You know, we're not in the top 40 or anything, but we are aspiring to be, so you never know. Um, yeah, I will mean, say that, like, I think our band couldn't have worked being thrust onto a, a big stage, because, like, for us and, like, our, like, we came up at the same time, like, we grew up with uh, that bit. I don't know if y'all have heard of Deer Hunter, but they were, they were, they were horrible. They started in our basement, and they were one of the worst bands I've ever seen in my life. And it took them, I mean, it took them a few years before they could even play. If they would have gotten thrown into, like, the blog world or gotten hyped real fast, I don't know if they, because I think a lot of bands, or at least when it's, well, with our kind of bands, I guess, but you need time to suck for a long time and figure out how to suck in front of people and not really care about it. I think a lot, of, a lot of bands will get shot up and then it's like your first show is at Coachella and you don't know how to perform in front of people. I mean, Deer Hunter used to not play songs. We used, I mean, both of our bands used to be more just like performance art and like pouring beer and firecrackers on each other. Uh, <laughs> but you need that, you need that, you get thrown out there and just kind of like tackle it yourself. I mean, adversity and struggle, I think, if we wouldn't have been through so much together, like me and him have gone through so many like pretty dark, uh, I mean they were funny dark, but uh, like having to do those together, it's like really nothing could really set us back after, you know, we've been thrown out of multiple countries, uh, visa, passport problems, jail, hospitals. Yeah. But it all, like, it builds, it, it builds character. Yeah, it's really interesting how the industry's changed in, like, the last 13 years, like, we've been playing. When we first started, the internet, it was around, but it wasn't as strong as it is now. So I remember we'd make press packets and make, like, a photocopied picture, get an envelope, you know, send a tape or a CDR to a club, and then just wait for a response. And sometimes the response would never come. We'd just be waiting, like, can we play that club in Cleveland? Uh, and then slowly the internet started to get stronger and stronger. We could just send your music to different clubs. And then I started to see bands really just break through the internet without major labels. Like Deer Hunter hadn't toured as much as we had, but then they got on a blog called like Pitchfork, and Pitchfork loved them. And I saw them all of a sudden playing these big crowds without actually having toured as much as we did. So I was a little envious. I was like, how can you just do that? But the industry is constantly changing. So I feel like there's no rules. Like, yeah, you should never get too set in any set of rules because they can always change. Like at one point, I wanted to study a film, and I noticed they were taking out the film programs in all the colleges to go to video because that was the industry standard. So uh, I would prefer to just join my band and make our own like little Super 8 films by ourselves because I was having trouble finding schools with film programs. But yeah, I'm glad I, I did the music. And I, I think like everyone. Like ever since we started, because we, when we finally started like dealing with labels and talking to people and like doing stuff serious, uh, all we've ever heard since we, since we started was the music industry's dead and everything's imploding and there's no way to make money. And I've heard that for ten years. And really, the only people that say that are the only, or from my experience, it's like, yeah, labels aren't as strong anymore, and that's kind of a good thing. Like for the artists, like it, I think it's a lot easier now to get your stuff out there and to really do everything DIY. I mean, you can make a song on GarageBand in your, in your living room and then put it out. Make your own video. Yeah, and like the labels complain because they don't make any money, but artists never made any money anyways. So that's never affected us. And that only affected a few people. Like when we, so like I, I would say like 99, 2000 is the last time major, I mean, aside from just like huge top 40 people, you don't get, signing bonuses or like expense accounts or anything like that. that doesn't exist anymore but that never affected us and i don't think that affects anyone now 
because record sales you don't make money from. And actually now that people like CDs are finally done, you can actually make money from vinyl and downloads and stuff. Yeah. Also, labels are so irrelevant. <laughs> Yeah. Well, one interesting too is like how when we were first starting, it was like really uncool to like to work with a corporation. If you had a song on a commercial, that would have been like a death sentence for our band. But as the industry like kind of tanked, it seemed like people are more accepting of bands trying to find income through other ways. So yeah, my advice as far as working with corporations is like try to have them not very invasive. Like we would do a show at Harley Davidson, and they'd want to put their giant banner on the backdrop and so we'd always try to say hey could you put the backdrop like on the side stage or somewhere else um, and you'd be surprised how corporations will like give you money and you don't even really have to do that, yeah, you don't do that do, much. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> yeah and people <laughs> like we were really like real worried about ever using stuff like that just because like Growing up, like liking punk rock and stuff, anything you do, like everything's like your sellout. Or I think that whole culture is pretty, pretty dated because that's really how most of the bands that we tour with and play with. That's how they make ends meet and stuff. There are, I mean, we've said no to certain things. Like American Eagle wanted to take one of our songs uh, called "Bad Kids" and have a bunch of children cover the song, and I was like, oh, that might be kind of cool. But then they wanted to change. Like the words about like making good grades and sharing and like stuff like that. So that's when we we said no to that because that's like compromising the song. But if someone wants to take a song that's already written and use it for something, like by all means, like you know, I don't care. If George Bush was running for re-election and he wanted to use one of our songs, I wouldn't. I wouldn't care. I didn't write it for him. So I mean, I'm taking. I'm using the money. Like we're getting. Yeah, I would, I would look at that like even if I'm not for George Bush per se, I'd be like, I'm taking a Pokemon and use it for my for something good or whatever, I don't know. But we're not really like a political band, but sometimes we do fall into like political situations. Like recently we went to, um, we want to travel everywhere. So first we played Israel, and then recently we played in the Middle East. We went to like, Egypt, Syria, uh, Northern Iraq. We didn't go to Syria. I'm oh, not Syria, I'm sorry, um, <laughs> Lebanon. <laughs> I get it all mixed up because we've been in so many places. But when we went to Jordan, they were like, you played Israel, so they canceled our show. Um, and uh, we had to like talk with the promoters about why they canceled our show. And they were like, well, we're trying to have a cultural boy boycott on Israel. And so you guys are supporting them. And we just told them we're not really so much political. We just want to play for all the people we can in the world. We don't really discriminate against who we play for. We also went into Palestine. And, and yeah, I would play. There. When we played Israel, we played Palestine and Israel. And the kids we were playing for have nothing to do with any sort of occupation at all. It's, we're just playing for kids. I don't care where they are. Uh, but uh, another th uh, awesome thing about doing this was like our main goal was just to travel as much as we could. Because you get to travel pretty much for free. And when you go to certain places, you're with people that are you know, your age, like to do the same kind of things, kind of. So you have like, the, pretty much the ultimate tour guide. And we've gotten to some really cool experiences that you wouldn't get. Uh, I've traveled on my own before. And you know, when you go somewhere you don't know anyone, it's cool. But it's also nice when you get to go to someone's grandma's house in Lebanon and have her make you dinner. And uh, it's a really cool way to see the world. I heard one of your teachers talking about studying abroad and I would highly recommend that. If I would have had the if I would have gone to college I would have done that. Yeah, yeah. We actually met like a lot of students abroad too when we toured. Like when we were in Egypt, I was really surprised to see uh, American students. Some of them were there like during the Arab Spring and I was like, wow, I, I had no idea. Like there's kids all over the world uh, studying different stuff. So that's really cool. Um, how are we doing on time? Because we we're also talking about playing a couple of songs. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I guess we were going to show a couple of music videos yeah. just to show you like some of the do-it-yourself stuff we've done. Y'all are all like in a music program kind of thing? I don't really know where we are right now. <laughs> yeah, so um, here's like a here's like a video we did just, I, I was really in a black and uh, super super eight film, so, so, <laughs> sorry, until I didn't go to school here. Oh yeah, we made this video ourselves. Yeah. 
he and our other guitarist, he's actually from New Orleans here. Yeah, I really like how the Super 8 uh, film, film looks. It's like uh, a lot of people shooting like, HD, I think it looks like a lot like more old school or warm, you know? Okay, that's just like a little taste of that. I can show you, like, we also did like a homemade video for um, Bad Kids, our friend just produced. He had a bunch of riot footage um, from the UK, and then he um, made a video, and so we didn't even have to do anything. He just edited a bunch of riot footage, and we got over like two million hits for this, for this video. So that was a, that was really an easy video to make. I feel like music videos are the best way to get your music out there, you know? just like a silly song we made and, and ended up getting in a soundtrack for like 500 Days of Summer. And yeah, our video did really well that we just kind of threw together with some footage. So I feel like, you know, you, you never know. You could just easily run into success by just messing around and stuff, <laughs> just making silly songs. Yeah, like if, you, if your heart's in anything and you like are, if you're doing what you want to do, and you're 100% dedicated to it. Like we were lucky because we were all, we all found each other at a very early age and had a like really had the same goal. So it was like four people working towards <laughs> the exact same thing. Uh, and it's like if you like try hard enough for something, that sounds like stupid and cliche, but really we have like that's the way. Like if we want something, we all just think about it a lot, and then it happens like almost every time. Yeah, yeah. I've been really inspired as well by the uh, hip hop world. So a lot of the way that industry works is a lot different, but I definitely see how artists just make their own songs like Jerry was talking about, make a video. We're friends of this uh, rapper you may have heard of named Riff Raff, and he's just become like a total cultural phenomenon just from scratch with like no real help from anybody, just doing it himself. So. Yeah, he just decided he wanted to, to do that. Yeah, and it's, yeah he's, he's, he, I highly recommend looking up his videos. Also, the guys from like Odd Future, which is a rap group from LA, yeah, it, it seems like they're really exciting and really good at just like making up new ways to attack the media. It's definitely good to make a spectacle. I think if you can have a story about your band to make people interested in your band, it will always help. Like, there's a million great bands, but why should you listen to that one when you can download a million great bands? You kind of need like a spectacle or a story sometimes to make you interested in why you should even listen to that band. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, is there anything else you want to say? Because we'll probably play a couple songs in a second. Okay. Yeah. We didn't. Oh, okay. Yeah. What, you know. What we want to I guess we can do "Dirty Hands." Honestly, um, we don't sound very good acoustically. We usually play electrically. So, if it sounds a little funny, here we go. Yeah. yeah I guess we do "Dirty Hands." Sure. I don't know what else. Yeah, I don't know because we don't know where the country is. Yeah. Uh... Oh, um, can we get the magic time on the light stand? This is another light that we uh, bought for like you know. Couple... This is one of the more expensive lights. Yeah, it's like a couple hundred bucks, but it it does really well. It's psychedelic and stuff. So we it kind of makes it more entertaining. Sometimes like it can mask that we don't sound that good. We can mask that with like lighting. And it doesn't look. I think it looks cool, but our light show's real budget, and clubs, and especially festivals, get really bummed out when we bring our, uh, our own, we have our own backdrop that we made, and these lights that are always broken. 
Right. Yeah. I think it's charming. Yeah, the backdrop, we just got bed sheets and spray painted our name on there. So you can do a lot of stuff for like cheap and it, it's like effective. Okay, yeah. Is there, there's a song, uh, Dirty Hands, yeah. Okay. One, two, three, four. We'll do it over. Cause all I really want is you to be together. Cause I'm gonna stick with you and win weather And I really think it's cool to do whatever Cause you're gonna do What you wanna do by the water. Then I got a tattoo of a dolphin on my belly button. And he got a tattoo that said Panama City Beach 3000. Do it ever. Cause I really wanted you to be forever. Cause I'm gonna stick with you and let go. And I really think it's cool to do whatever. Cause you're gone. What's the last one, dude? Yeah. All right. So I, we don't know this one either. We're just gonna wing. <laughs> T for Texas. T for Tennessee. T for Texas. T for Tennessee. T for So basically, it's just all about passion. And if you believe in yourself, then, you know, I mean, who's to say what's good and what's bad? Like, there's a lot, I mean, there's a lot of really technical players that I can't stand listening to. Uh, I mean, my favorite groups are like, like the Ramones couldn't play at all. And they were, I think, phenomenal. And uh, yeah, if you believe in yourself, you can do it. Um, do, does anybody have any questions or anything they want? Can I do the Q&A's at two early or? Oh, Tim Moore, okay. We can keep going then. Um, well, I guess I could, should I show the Middle East thing or? Okay, did you, you like find it? Bill's teaser? 
Yeah, let me, let me show you guys a little thing from when we went to the Middle East. Yeah, we're making a movie right now, or we're premiering a movie uh, in a few weeks in LA and one at South by Southwest uh, about our trip to the Middle East. We worked on it for like two years. Originally, we were supposed to, it was centered around Syria, and we actually spent time at the Syrian embassy in DC and had a lot of support there. But then shit hit the fan, and so we had to postpone it for a year and went through other countries. But that was something that we worked on for a long time because we're going to be the first band to play on all seven continents. Uh, we like to break records, and we want to be in the Guinness Book of World Records because it's really prestigious. Um, you, you want me to play the Bills one or the noisy one? Bills is better. <laughs> yeah, this is just like a short one. Is this it? Oh, hold on, I'll just hit the sound real quick. Stop protest today. I know the fires of anti Americanism are burning around the world today. Over 30 countries saw protests today, and now a total of six American posts have come under attack. In Tunisia, two protesters were killed by local police. Three more were shot down in Sudan. And in Lebanon, it was American restaurants that felt the crowd's wrath. Hey, we're in the Black Lives Matter from Atlanta, Georgia. Thank you guys for coming out. National Peace Day, what's, what's wrong with that? Because we're having fun. This is what it's all about, I guess. I feel like we're almost diplomats for the people. Like we're just regular people, we share music. I guess there's protests starting in, in Amman and all the pictures I saw from it looked pretty crazy, but I mean, we were just there. We played a rock show and it was totally like anywhere else in Europe we play. One amazing thing about um, traveling to the Middle East was I was actually scared like from the American media what they told us about going there like I thought people were gonna kill us because we we're Americans and then when I got there I saw something totally different than I saw in the news and when you're playing music and you meet people like people are just people I mean I'm sure we could have gotten in some sort of altercation had we tried but it just felt like anywhere else they had their own scene with they like heavy metal there it's really pop popular in the Middle East and yeah, it was like a new learning experience for us to go there and find out that they like similar types of music and, and want to have fun. Yeah, I would say traveling is definitely probably one of the best learning experiences you can get because, yeah, everything we saw, in the, like our parents were freaking out before we went. We're calling our label and our manager, trying to get them to cancel the tour. It looked like Dante's Inferno from what you saw in Al Jazeera and CNN and even like BBC. And when we got there, it was really, I mean, People are selling pictures and stuff, so it's like one block in front of the embassy where it's crazy. And I mean, it's not as 
as bad as everyone thinks. And we learned that just by like going over there. Now we have a ton of friends over there, and it's. I mean, I, we've had more trouble with people being mean to us in France and Italy than we ever did over there. So I mean, it's just, I mean, I, it changes, but uh, yeah. traveling is definitely the best way to learn anything, and it's just fun. Yeah, one time we did have um, a culture shock though, because you know we've traveled all around the world. We've done six out of seven continents, and we went to uh, India, and we had a hard experience there with a little bit of culture shock. Um, one of the stunts or hijinks our band does to shock people sometimes is like me and Jared or me and Ian will kiss each other, like t French kiss each other while we're playing our guitars. It's just like a stupid like hat trick. Um, but we tried that in India and that was highly offensive, so much that our whole tour got canceled um, and we had nothing to do there. All of a sudden we had like no dates and then there was all this money invested in the tour and the promoters were losing money. So then they wanted us to pay them and they like try to confiscate our passports and we had to like pretty much like the buck up to them to get it. Yeah. And so we that, had to drive so, overnight to a different part of the country to not get in trouble. Yeah, so basically we had to f like f basically flee India cuz we offended them so much with the act of homosexuality. So, yeah, things can go also go bad if you like go out to new lands and try to bring new ideas to different people, you know. But I think it was, it was good for them. Some of the kids there had never, when we played in northern Iraq, some of the kids had never seen a rock and roll show, and maybe the same case in India. So that, that felt like really heartwarming to bring a, something new to people in a new land, you know. None of the kids were upset about that. They were happy about it. We were actually playing at a university there when we got into the trouble. The kids are the same everywhere, I mean, pretty much. People are the same everywhere. Yeah. Um, Do y'all have any questions, or is there anything y'all would like to know? <laughs> we can. You. I'll get you next. Uh, I was playing in Houston like two, three years ago. It was an awesome show. One of the best, the friendliest mosh pit I've ever been in. I mean that in a good way. Like, yeah, our mosh pit, we try to keep our mosh pits friendly. Yeah, and uh, uh, I was just wondering, like, y'all say you build all your stuff, and uh, I remember I got a shirt from your show that had, like, two guys on it on a bed, and then there was, like, a tree coming out of his ass, and it was oh, awesome. Yeah. And uh, do y'all make your own merch or just do your own art? Well, that one we stole from, like, uh, some German homo homoerotic novel. Uh, awesome. <laughs> But we like the image a lot. Yeah, I mean, I liked it. I bought it. Like, it was great. It was a great show. I had a fun time. And yeah, actually, at that show, we not so much anymore, but we used to have a lot of trouble with promoters and stuff. Um, uh, they charged us like seven or eight hundred dollars because we set off just a little black cat somewhere on their, like, on the drum carpet. In it Houston. Was just a few, yeah, maybe. Uh, that sounds like Houston. But uh, yeah, it was really for just like a little square carpet. It was the most expensive piece of carpet, carpet we ever bought. But actually a lot of times, that's a, a, like with the entertainment aspect, when things are going bad, like we have a lot of problems with bouncers and you mentioned the friendly mosh pits. Like our, our crowd, especially in the front, tends to be like small kids, like 17 to 25 probably. I was like 16 or something. Okay, yeah. yeah so, I'm 20. and they don't hurt each other, and you know, it's mostly just dancing. And I think a lot of, especially at venues where they've never had uh, per, like an audience that participates and stuff, like bouncers can go way, like way into overkill mode. And it really could be, like sometimes, like I've been beaten up by bouncers before, and we've had like mini riots, but it's never the kid's fault, it's theirs. But we've tried to start using that to our advantage to where we can kind of turn ourselves into looking like heroes, like leave them alone and like we'll get in. And then it adds to the whole, the element of the show. So, and it kind of diffuses the situation because most bouncers are knuckleheads and they just want to crack some skulls and you know, our audience is you know, pretty lightweight. So for the most part, but we use, you can use that to your advantage and manipulate that and try and make the best out of a bad situation. We like to make the best out of bad situations as much as we can. Yeah, we definitely like to bring the danger back to rock and roll. Like I felt like in the old days, like rock and roll was like a bad thing. You know, like you didn't want your kids to go to the rock and roll show, and now it's kind of the opposite. Now it's like the corporations are the bad guys, but like I want us to be the bad guys. You know, but it's all in good fun too. You know, like we're not trying to like be bad people. It's just good, bad, not evil. You know. 
Uh, you had a question? Yeah. Th uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, that Lundy Gras show a couple of years ago was like one of the best shows the city's like ever seen, like since I've been here. So thanks a lot again for coming. And I think um, a lot of bands, especially in the program, can like look up to you guys because a lot of um, the stuff they're doing is DIY and everything. We don't get to see a lot of bands that have hit the level you have with like the background that a lot of these bands are coming from. So thanks a lot for that. Um, I want to ask how the Mark Ronson um, collaboration came about, because he's a producer that you know wouldn't normally probably work with a band like you guys, but he, he has a really unique, funky background, and um, that collaboration came out like really well, so how'd that really come about? That goes exactly how I was saying earlier about how when we want to do things, we just think about it a lot, and it happens. And I think it's just, I don't, I'm not very spiritual, but there's like cosmic powers and mental power, <laughs> but uh, we just thought about it like our label, Vice, we're on a label called Vice Records, and they always wanted us to have a producer, and we were like, no, that's stupid, I don't even know what a producer is, so kind of, to be kind of cheeky, we just made this ridiculous list of producers, like, we are like, all right, Danger Mouse, Dr. Dre, Mark, we just made, like, there's no way they'll get any of these guys, and then Mark Ronson happened to call, like, he heard he was on the list, and then he called, we had some mutual friends, and he, <laughs> called and we would never be able to afford him but he just wanted to do it as like kind of he went from like doing Adele and you know those tier people to like like us and it was it was a learning experience for both of us but now I know what a producer does and it was awesome thanks yeah oh you have a question yeah. So like you guys said you lost a lot of money early on doing like like personal goals and everything. Uh, when did when did y'all see like a first step I guess in like being sustainable and like I guess not success as far as your own goals, but success as far as like taking a step in like a professional direction? I can tell you my exact moment. What, well, what we used to do, we'd work for a month. We, me and him worked at a diner, and I'd do construction work on the side. But we'd work for a month, save up, go on tour, blow it all, you know, and just did that for a few years, just on repeat. And eventually, we kind of stopped working and just kind of just lived mostly on girls' couches. <laughs> but um, uh, we were in Europe, and we finished a tour, and I was ready to be like, OK, how much do we lose? This is going to suck. And I think we all, like at the very end, we were like, we had an excess, and we all got like 300 euros. So I just stayed in Europe for the rest of the summer and somehow made that, that last. And then when I got home after that, I was thinking about going back to work and I was like, we had another tour that we did. I can't, oh, we went on tour with this band called The Dirt Bombs and we did that. And I came home and I was like, I don't have to go to work because I can, my rent was cheap and I could do it. And then it slowly got, I mean, we we're still destitute, but I could still afford to eat. And that was the moment when I was like, I don't have a day job anymore. But that took, Everyone's different. It took us seven years, pretty much, to do that. Yeah, one, one major hump for us was getting on a, a record label that was strong enough to d distribute us and you know, just get us on the platform where we could reach a broader audience. And that was like Vice Records, our label. Like, once they signed us, then all of a sudden, a bigger booking agent came along. And then the, the label like, bought a publicist, which we'd never had before in, in the first like, six or seven years. So then it made it a lot easier. Like, if we would come to town, they would call the local paper, the publicist, and make sure we had a little write-up, or try to get us a write-up. And then we'd get some national press, like in Rolling Stone. They eventually got us on Conan O'Brien. So I, a lot of times when you see hype with bands, a lot of times they have like a good publicist like really working that. Yeah, it's all um, yeah. And, that, and that's what I liked about guys like Riff Raff. It seemed like, for a while, he probably didn't even have a publicist. He might not, still not. And he was really just getting out there by himself. So. That, that's pretty impressive. But with us, like Vice even told us, the only reason we got signed to them, they were like, we would never sign you in a million years if you guys wouldn't have done all the legwork before. Because basically, we don't, they didn't have to work very hard once we got there. If they would have just picked us up off the street. Like, we used to drive from Atlanta to New York almost every weekend and just play like Polish restaurants and warehouses and stuff. And eventually, we were almost like a local band up there for a while. And they were like, well, you've, we built like our own organic fan base and done all the shitty work and they just had the machine that could help us yeah. kind of bump us up a little bit. Yeah, so it was really expensive to live in New York with a lot of the industries there, so we just that, that's why we'd go there constantly, you know? But then it was cheaper to live in Atlanta. Um, I know 
you all like to tour a lot over in Europe. I worked with the Nomads over the summer and prepared y'all's backline for the. Oh, you were okay. July. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, but what would you say is like one of the major differences between touring in Europe and touring in the U.S., especially for like a DIY band like yourself? The main, the the crazy thing about Europe is you can eat shit over here and sleep on floors or in the van all the time, and no one will come to you know no one comes to see you. You can do the same in Europe, and even if no one comes to see you in Europe, all your meals are provided. You have a bed every night, not just a floor to sleep on, but like even if you're staying at someone's house, they like have cots ready for you. We were blown away when we got there because we were still, you know, averaging like 15 or 20 people a show, but we'd have a big, they'd make dinner for us, they'd make breakfast for us. They, I mean, they're just hospi uh, hospitality is a lot uh, better over there. But then once you get a little above that, like touring in Europe doesn't make a lot of sense because. Touring is all about weird hours and you need convenience. And since America is a convenience culture, it's perfect. Like in Europe, forget about doing laundry or getting something to eat after like eight. Or if you're on tour, it's, it's really not conducive for the touring hours and schedule. But they, they do treat, especially American bands, I mean, I, or I guess the ones I know, they treat you really well. Yeah, they have a higher etiquette. I feel like they don't take it for granted. Like, I think there's like lot less rock and roll bands over there. Like, Sometimes we won't have an opening act in a small town in Germany, whereas if we play America, there'll be like three or four bands sometimes. Um, but actually, England can be kind of hard, too. I think they have a, a large rock and roll scene, so it could be a little harder to tour there. Like, they, they take it for granted, and you might end up sleeping on a floor or something. It's but the rest of Europe is, yeah, they have a really nice etiquette. <coughs> okay. Anybody else? Did I see a hand? No. Here we go. Okay, there we go. Thanks, Kevin. Hey. Oh, all right, cool. Hey. Um, I just had a quick question about, like, so um, Will was talking about how, like, touring Europe and, like, you would get, like, all your meals and, like, stuff like that over there. And when you did the Middle East, how, what kind of, how did you get your stuff over there? Did you go through, like, our European rental company? Or, like, how, how did that, like, come about? What was, like, the process of that was definitely there, challenging. there's absolutely no infrastructure for touring at all in the Middle East outside of Beirut there's I mean even in Cairo we were the first we were the first non-Egyptian band or non-Arabic band to play there since Shakira and that was a few years ago and I don't really count that because she played a huge show at the pyramids but there really isn't anything there's no concept of touring over there there's not even really a highway system that you can like it's the same, pretty much only Europe and America where you can do traditional like highway tours and stuff. Uh, I mean, in Iraq, we used, our drum set was a suitcase and we all just plugged straight into uh, like a soundboard PA system. So it was really, it was really, uh, we had to throw everything together, but it ended up working. But there's no infrastructure in the Middle East for touring. Yeah, I think we may have, we pretty much lost money on that tour. That was something again where we had to kind of. If you all saw the passion. Converse logo on that video, we would not have gone there if we wouldn't have Converse wouldn't have helped pay for flights and food and stuff like that. There was no money. But yeah, that was definitely like a passion-driven thing more than like uh, money or we're gonna be living it up like on you know real fancy. It was something we just really wanted to do. So it was a little bit of like a sacrifice that Middle East trip, but we just thought it was like kind of important to share our music around the world. Um, is, that, is that it? I think we're almost at three, so, or six. Well, we're at the end of our time. Yeah, appreciate it, you guys. Thank you for having us.